Hey, Randy. Well, so you still with Rick, huh? Still here. You in there? Yeah, just knock. Just, just look, just, just, just put them in the wardrobe, all right? And what's it gonna hurt? Then if you need them, you got them, all right? <laughs> then they gotta have a conversation with that wardrobe assistant, and man, she's a <laughs> I just don't, I, please. Look, I, look Randy, I, I'm asking you to help me out, man. If the, if the answer's no, the, the answer's no. Not, not no with excuses. Hey, man. This ain't a Andy McLaughlin picture, you know? And I can't afford to hire a bunch of guys that smoke cigarettes and sit around talking to each other all day on the chance that I might use them. So that was a clip from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And I'm delighted and a little bit overawed to be joined by two of its stars, Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Could you uh, set the scene for us, uh, for the listeners, in terms of uh, where the film's set? 1969, Hollywood. I think there's a cultural revolution happening. A, a change in, in cinema as well. The age of the, uh, the pompadours and the handsome cowboys are a bygone era, and now it's the hippie re revolution happening. Easy Rider. And he takes the approach of focusing on two characters, which he kind of recently told us he saw on set, which was an actor and his stunt double, watching their relationship and their interaction with one another. And through this sort of collage of thought over 10 years, decided to make them the sort of uh, focal point of this movie. Two guys that realize that their expiration date has sort of come and they're watching this new cultural revolution happen and they're sort of struggling to remain relevant amongst that. And then of course you have Sharon Tate and, and Polanski representing the, the new era of Hollywood that they uh, so desperately want to belong to, or at least Rick desperately does. You mentioned that you play Rick, of course. Uh, you play Cliff Booth. You just give us a little bit about who they are. You just mentioned that relationship between actor and stuntman. Well, at that time, you know, it, it's different than it is now. Uh, at that time, uh, an actor could stay with his, have a stuntman, they could stay together their entire careers and really relied on each other. And were more responsible for inventing the scenes, the action quotient of the film. So, I mean, we looked, we got to talk to Burt Reynolds a lot, who famously partnered with Hal Needham. Mm -hmm. I had known Bud Eakins, met the great Bud Eakins, who was partnered with Steve McQueen and, you know, was responsible for the great escape, the jump, and Bullet, the famous car chase. So, but really what it's about and what's universal for Leo and I is those friends that are there during the downtime. Those, you know, there's actually quite a bit of downtime. And um, these, these friends are what make it worthwhile, make it not only survivable, but uh, quite fun. I mean, on film sets or theatre or whatever, it, it it becomes this little ecosystem, doesn't it? And I think mm. Hollywood does Absolutely. as well, and that everything happens within that. Uh, it's obviously territory that you both have experienced. So, in terms of these particular people, were they people that you knew? Were you, were you able to draw on people that you met? I feel like I implicitly knew who these guys were. I don't know. I, I uh, I've grown up in Los Angeles, so I know. What a unique opportunity it is to be able to, A, be a working actor, but then uh, secondly, to be able to choose your own work and, and make choices. You know, I have uh, lots of actor friends that I've, I've grown up with. And in a lot of ways, this, uh, this is his homage to those that maybe have been forgotten historically. I mean, Quentin is somebody that literally watches television and movies all day long. So, <laughs> He's got a lot of heroes and influences that I needed to do my research on because they've sort of been forgotten, in particular an actor like Ralph Meeker, who said, watch this performance in this 1960s black and white television show. Look how, look at the vulnerability of this guy. He never quite made the television to film transition, but he's one of my favorite actors of all time. And you go into that rabbit hole with him and you're like, you're right, wow. And it's his, it's, it's his love letter to those in the industry that, you know, ultimately, this is a story in a lot of ways about uh, uh, being mortal, mortality, realizing that, you know, you may have not achieved everything you wanted to, but it's his sort of love letter to those who've given their own contributions in their own right in this industry, I think. Mm -hmm. But he's also, in all of his films actually, in this one as well, has populated it with very much those kind of actors. 
You know, I was looking mm -hmm. at this and mm -hmm. I was thinking that Clue Gallagher, mm -hmm. it was a name that I just remembered yeah. seeing in TV shows mm -hmm. across the 70s mm -hmm. and 80s. He's, he's in there, Nicholas Hammond, who people may remember as a Von Trapp kid, mm -hmm. but to me he was Spider-Man, Spider mm -hmm. you know, in the 70s as well, he did mm -hmm. that TV show. And he's always done that, hasn't he? Whether it's it, Kurt Russell coming up, but people who mm. worked in that era, Bruce Dern is another mm. one who worked through that. Brad, you and I are the same age. Uh, and Leo, you're annoyingly 10 years younger, I guess. Um, so in terms of the, the research part of it, I guess, do you remember some of the shows and the ads? I remember a lot of it. Um, oh, okay. um, uh, uh, certainly, you know, what he pop, he, Quentin's our age as well. Hmm. And so a lot of the same reference points. I remember, you know, it's my first earliest memories of television or music and, and, uh, um, I mean, certainly when Mannix comes on or the Neil, Di Neil Diamond Hot August Nights, I'm, that's, that was my childhood, that was, that was my dad, that was my dad's jam, you know. <laughs> and Liam, I guess you had to do, actually this is a question really, which was just about preparation. Yeah. So I did read somewhere, or maybe I heard you say in an interview that you were given backstories for your characters, yeah. detailed backstories. That's really unusual, isn't yeah. it? Because I, I mean, I've only ever got like a paragraph it, or a five minute chat. It could with the actually have been a prequel. There could have been a, maybe even one, two, yeah. and this would have been the third. He had so much backstory for That's us. That's the brilliant thing about getting to work with Quentin. Not only do you go through this research process with him where you screen films and look at television shows, and you know, I got exposed to actors like Eddie Burns or Ty Harden, that those guys that didn't make the Steve McQueen television to movie transition and are exposed to all that as reference points, but then he. You know, much like he's forensic about that kind of stuff, he also creates the fairy tale. And the fairy tale is, these guys are real people. Cliff Booth and Rick Dalton are real people that fit into that history. And here's their entire backstory in great detail. Here's all the experiences you've been through together. So weirdly enough, this is a movie about, you know, it's a slice of life. It's sort of two days in the life of these guys. And yet, when Brad and I, I felt, instinctively when we set, when we wound up on set we kind of knew who these guys were mm -hmm. and there was a, almost a weird silence between us because you know these relationships that you rely on and I have those relationships where you could just sit and be quiet with somebody because you've told every story there is to tell mm -hmm. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean mm -hmm. and it gave an ease to our relationship in a weird way mm -hmm. like we'd one, been through that one of Rick Dalton's famous films is 14 Fist of McCluskey it's great and it just sounds like a Film from that era, doesn't I, it? It's well, bang I, on. It, it, like, I, I kill, believe it. Kill Me Now, Ringo, said the gringo. That's a movie that I want to see. I really do want to see <laughs> There's it. a few of them. But that must have been great fun, actually, playing those different era films. Just those, they're almost like sketches, aren't they? With real historical reference points, too. Real, real directors mixed in with real actors mixed in with his own unique fantasy and take on what that movie is. Mm. I want to say that both of you have worked with Quentin Tarantino before. Can you pinpoint what specifically it is that makes his, the on set thing fun or different to other directors? Well, for him, there's a, there's a real appreciation of getting to be there mm -hmm. and uh, a love of process. And it's contagious and everyone's along for the ride. It's really, there's a, there's a great ease, for as big and as specific as his films are, there's a great ease to the cadence of a day on his set. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think everyone, he likes to surround himself with people that have a great appreciation for that art form and love what they do. I mean, he, every, what, hundredth roll, there's, a, there's tequila shots <laughs> and there's a chant because we love making movies, you know? I think he, he feels like, a, Ultimately, he, uh, he's never forgotten that he was very lucky to have this opportunity. And that's why he takes the process so seriously. But he, he, you see, he revels in the time being there as well as the end product, mm. I think. I mean, this does feel like the perfect era for a Tarantino movie. I mean, all of his other films feel mm. like they could have been made through the lens of the late 60s and the early 70s, whether mm. it's the Buddy stuff, the Butch Cassidy, Freebie and the Bean stuff, whether it's Freebie the and the Bean, uh, good callback. Oh, love that very one. Much. Love Thank that you. one. Um, the Peckin Pub sort of violence, the humor, which is kind of really dark and stuff like that. Mm. Um, it always feels like an en ensemble, all of his movies mm. uh, do. 
The other thing I, I think is useful to mention is that the Sharon Tate uh, element of the story is one that kind of worried me before I saw the film mm -hmm. in terms of would it be exploitative. But actually the once upon a time fairy tale element of it was quite magical. So in a way, sh the Sharon Tate character brings the sunshine, the hope and the future. Rick Dalton Precisely. is the past and, and Cliff is I don't, it's kind of like Zen. Present time. Present, pre yeah. <laughs> yeah present. There was that real Good. balance between them, I thought. Is that fair? I think that's fair, yeah. I think it's very fair. What was that comparison? Yeah, Cliff Booth is the present, I'm the past, she's the future. What was it? Something like that. Yeah. Somebody I'm, made that. She was hope. She was hope, yeah. I'm, uh, it just shows you my memory's gone. So we'll <laughs> It's move an age on. thing, right? I, it's a, <laughs> I share it. It is. That. I don't fight it. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. I think we've, right. we've been given Thank the you. messages, but that was a pleasure. All right. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks.